I'm going to throw Joe a curveball. This is not going to be a conversation, uh, sorry, a presentation. I'm going to invite my friend John Spear to come up, and we're going to have a discussion on what is arguably one of the most important and most screwed up topics in the entire medical device industry. We didn't and agree on this. Say it again? We didn't agree on this. Yeah, but I'm, is it okay? I don't know. I mean, John's talking tomorrow. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> well, I'm talking tomorrow, too. <laughs> but I just figured that, uh, that this is, you know, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and listen, John and I both know this topic very well. We don't need any slides. So I want to have a little bit of a discussion, and I want to invite all of you to, uh, to participate as, as, as well, because I genuinely believe, as I said a moment ago, that this is a very important topic and, to and a topic that, quite frankly, so many companies screw up. Does anybody know what one of the most common reasons why companies get warning letters and 483s from the FDA? Yes, ma'am. Or, 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 yeah, n not following design change rules, assuming that the rules make sense. I've never made the assumption that rules make sense. But not doing what makes sense when it comes to changing a product. And we're going to talk about that this afternoon. For those, for those of you in the audience, how many of you have been involved with bringing a medical device onto the market? Okay. How many of you have been involved, once your product has gotten onto the market, changing it in some way? Most of you. Now, this is not a drug audience, but if I was doing this presentation at a drug audience and asked the same question, how many people do you think would raise their hands to that second question? Zero. Zero. One of the many interesting differences between drugs and medical devices is medical devices, by their nature, are very iterative, and companies make changes. On the other hand, when it comes to drugs, drug development is not very iterative, although, although that's going to change in the future. But more importantly, drug companies are absolutely paranoid to make a change to a product once it gets onto the market. To a some extent, medical device companies can be paranoid as well. I've worked with uh, several medical device companies, including some of the largest medical device companies on earth, that have said as a matter of company policy to their R&D engineers, if you're going to change a device, only change it to the point that we can handle that change internally, doing what we call a letter to file. Do not change it beyond a certain point where we have to notify the FDA via either a special 510K or a PMA supplement. Now, perhaps as a biomedical engineer, you'll understand that's what, that's what makes my blood pressure just shoot through the roof. Because can you think of any better way to prevent or hamstring development than putting a limitation on that to your R&D engineers? So, John, when we talk about change management in the context of medical device development, what does that mean to you? Well, first of all, I felt like I should have done like the intro for the Global Medical Device <laughs> Podcast. But anyway, um, uh, you know, it's it's... I started my career as a product development engineer, and, and to your point, I mean, it's changes happen. I mean, the moment that you launch a product, something happens. You know, you're going to change a material, a supplier, uh, manufacturing is going to find something that you know a better way or or um, something that you forgot, and and so change management is is really uh, you know a, a key role um, for for any engineer uh, that is working in this space. So you, you really have to. You have to analyze, you know, and this, I'm a big fan of design control. Those of you who know me um, or read anything that I've written, I'm a huge design control nerd. And so design control doesn't, isn't just a design and development activity. It's not just something that you do while something is, is prior to, to market launch. Design control is pervasive throughout. So anytime you make a change, you have to assess and evaluate, you know, how does this impact the form, fit, and function? What are the VMV uh, implications of that? So, what are the risk implications of that? So, design control is something that should be living throughout the entire uh, product lifecycle as well. Could not agree more, John. Thank you for sharing that. And I want to come back to the question I asked a moment ago. Why is it, do you think, that so many companies get in trouble because of change management? And I don't think, quite frankly, it's a matter of following the rules. Right. I'm supposed or to be not. Phil Donahue, is what you Yeah, oh, 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 some of us are dating ourselves. <laughs> Uh, I think the post-market changes, and, and my sort of study of these numbers say that that's the big, that's the big bucket, right? It's, um, it's a different team. Right? So the reason why companies get in trouble is because they've made changes to the product? They make a post-market change. They don't update their risk file. They don't okay. update their, uh, their specifications. They don't validate that, they, that the change, uh, that the training was effective. It's all these sort of secondary things that, okay. that, that are normally required. Is, and the original team would have done them, but the second the sustaining team doesn't do anything. Okay, what's your first name, sir? Scott. Scott, I think that's part of the answer. That's a good start. Anybody else want to add to what Scott said? Or John, what would you add to that? Well, I, I would just build on what, what Scott was offering because in my experience, what, what happens during the design and development process 
is uh, the product development team does usually a pretty decent job of documenting design controls and risk management activities. And the moment that that design transfer happens, that file gets archived and buried. And, and those are not the people who will continue to maintain that product once it's in the manufacturing environment, to Scott's point. Now you have a sustaining team or a manufacturing team or some other group of people that did not design and develop the product whose responsibility is to, to author these changes. And they're making changes uh, blindly because that, that design history file, that risk management file, oftentimes is buried somewhere in archive. Uh, and, and they don't they don't go back to that design history file, those design controls, to see if that change that they're making has any impact upstream or downstream to to the the decisions that were made when that product was originally launched. So let's dig into this a, li a, a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we, go ahead. We have another yeah, opinion please. here. Well, John's gonna probably like smack me when I say this, but <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Well, I say that and too. what it depends on is a couple of things. First of all, we talk about a, a situation with a contract manufacturer where the 510K holder is not doing the manufacturing because there tends to be some drift, in my experience, once you turn it over to the contract manufacturing organization. And sometimes management doesn't want to even know what that drift looks like. So that's one reason. The other reason is fear of, of questioning or the risk of questioning when they make a submission to FDA. They, they don't want to face that. They don't want to take the risk of making a new submission and face questions about their product. So I think all of the, the comments that people have shared have all been very good. They've all been part of the answer. But I think we're still dancing around on the surface. You know, as an engineer, we like to think in terms of root cause, but oftentimes when I hear people talk about root cause, they don't get anywhere near close to the actual root cause. They're talking about the symptoms, the super mani superficial manifestations of a much deeper problem. And I think, quite frankly, the root cause to a lot of the problems that we're talking about here and a lot of the, 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 the reasons why companies get in trouble when they change products is because of what's up here or the lack thereof, the, the thinking, the analysis that goes into it. So let me, as my attorney friends like to say, lead the witness. If you're gonna change a medical device in an administrative way, you have sort of two options to handle that. What are the two options? Does anybody know? Let me give you a hint. You can either notify the FDA, and if we notify the FDA, how do we do that? Or we can not notify the FDA, and if we don't notify the FDA, how do we do that? So with that big hint, what are those two options? All right, so. If you're going to notify the FDA, what are some forms that you might communicate a change that you're making to the FDA? Special, Special 510K. 510K. Is there, are there any other examples that you can think of? How about if you're a class three device? PMA supplement. PMA supplement. All right. Okay, so those are ways that we can notify the FDA. What if we choose not to notify the FDA? Say it again? Letter to file. Letter to file. How does a company make that decision on whether or not they should notify the FDA or, or not notify them? Yeah, you can follow it if you want to, but let's be honest. Does that happen in most companies? I mean, quite frankly, I'm serious. What's the point of having a discussion if we're not going to be honest and candid? So at least in my experience, most people just don't do that. And even if they do follow the flowchart, for those of you that heard my uh, talk on substantial equivalence yesterday, give me any flowchart, any flowchart from FDA, I will make the result come out the, any way you want it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Backwards, sideways, this way, that way. So talk about reality. How do you and a company make that decision as to whether or not you need to tell the FDA? If it's a new indication, but now the question becomes, what does new mean? You know, how different from okay, your right. original so indication can your you new in indication? And now you're in the, uh, in the heart, then it's a new indication, right? But what if it's not quite that extreme? Okay, so labeling changes, that's one possibility. Yes, sir? Street? It automatically triggers an update to the risk management, and the risk new risk is escalated. Okay. That is a quantitative way to say, we assess the risk as high now, and we need to update. So I would agree that some companies will get to that eventually, but that's not usually where the conversation starts. Do you see what I have to deal with whenever we do a podcast? <laughs> Why? Because I'm, I'm kidding. No, about, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Because I talk about reality, and John talks about theory. They, they don't notify if they think the FDA will say no. Well, that's an interesting spin, Jeff. Sure. <laughs> don't you know? You of course, that could never happen in the real world, right? <laughs> you know, in, in my experience, I think what, what oftentimes happens is is we we go, uh, sir, what, what, what is your name? 
Uh, Patesh. Patesh, we go we go through the 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 FDA guidance document on deciding when to submit a 510k. We follow the flowchart. To Mike's point, we sort of uh, pick the path of least resistance. We may or may not document that decision, um, but more times than not, we choose not to communicate changes to the FDA because we can justify it through whatever means, you know. And and I, we may or may not document the letter to file which is interesting to me because I've seen a lot of companies that say, oh, that's a letter to file, and then they never document the decision. They never, there is no letter in a file. There are actually some advantages to not documenting <laughs> things done, but we'll talk about that in a moment. When it comes to product liability, that's a huge advantage. But we'll, we'll, if we have time, we can come back to that. Uh, but again, let's be honest here. How many people work in companies or let me not put you on the spot. How many people have heard about other medical device yeah, companies we out there? We have a friend who works. We have a friend who, who told us that the perception in their organization is that if the company chooses to do a letter to file, that's somehow less work than if they were to notify the FDA via a special 510K or PMA supplement. How many people have heard of this? I'm not asking you if you believe that. How many people, I, I, I think I'm being facetious here. Most, if not all, medical device companies believe that it, is a, that it is less work to do a letter to file. And this is where I believe that the industry standard is flat out wrong. I mean, 100%. I mean, we go through the decision tree. We, if we choose to document it, we may print out that flow chart. We highlight or circle the items. We may write a, a, a paragraph or a memo and, and document it and check the box and we're done. Right? That's the most common practice. That's Let's a very right. common practice. And that is, in fact, the industry standard. And as I started to say, the industry standard, in my opinion, is 100% wrong. Because typically, the way that that decision is made, we're going to make this change. Let's decide first, letter to file or special 510K, and then do the other stuff to go into it. I think that's 100% backwards. I work with companies all the time. I say, look, whether you're going to do a letter to file or a special 510K, it makes absolutely no difference. The amount of work that you have to do in terms of uh, thinking, in terms of analysis, in terms of literature search, in terms of benchtop testing, maybe additional other kind of testing, is exactly the same. The only question is, what do you do with that information? In some cases, you will take that information and literally put it into a file folder and put it in your three-drawer file cabinet. For those of you that don't remember what a three-drawer file cabinet is, you can look at it and uh, Google it. You'll see a picture. That's what we used to use in the olden days. That's why we call it a letter to file, right? Or you take exactly that same information and you put it into a different package. We call it a special 510K or a PMA supplement. We send it off to the FDA. The information is exactly the same. It's just a matter of what we do with it. And here's another reason why I write letter to files that way. If you make a change to, the, to a medical device and you choose for whatever reasons not to notify FDA, and in the future some knock on your door comes, it's the FDA, they say, hey, we, we've noticed that you've made a change to this device. You don't we don't remember you ever coming and talking to us about it. What the heck is going on? I don't want to be in a situation where I say, oh, gee, we forgot, or worse, darn, you caught us. I don't want to say that at all. I would say, oh, Mr. and Mrs. FDA reviewer, come on in, sit down, have a cup of coffee. I don't know, John, are we allowed to have them give them uh, coffee anymore? No. <laughs> Let me pull out my letter to file where we have completely documented, here's the change that we made, here's why we made it, here's all the testing that we've done to support it. Oh, by the way, here are a list of other companies that have made similar changes and they didn't notify you either. We take all of this, in other words, I want to make it painfully obvious to my friends at the FDA, and for those of you that heard my talk yesterday, I work as a consultant for the FDA, so I see these from both sides. I want to make it painfully obvious to my friends at the FDA that we know what the heck we're doing, that we're not forgetting something, that we're not hiding something. We made a business decision that based on the following reasons, we would not, or we, we, we decided not to notify you. The reason why I like that strategy is very simple, is because worst case scenario, if the FDA says, well, gee, thank you for sharing this, all, this information with us, we think you should have let us know, fine, not a problem. I take all that info from the, my letter to file, I put it into a new package, I repackage it, I put special 510K on it, you'll have it next week. What do you think of that approach, John? Well, I mean, it's um, the letter to file approach, I mean, I, I, I've been doing this for a day or two. Um, I'm gray hair on the beard, no hair on the top. But a lot of a lot of companies they they simply do this letter to file path because they want to minimize the work, right? And this is the key thing that Mike is <coughs> is illustrating here. The letter to file is not a substitute for the work. 
Uh, we, we still have to do the analysis. We have to make a decision as to when we make a change, what is the impact of that? We may have to update design control activities. We may have to update risk activities. We may have to do additional testing and analysis. <clears throat> it's just good, prudent engineering. I, I'm stealing um, one of your, your I, phrases. I, I, so. They, they um, say if you're going to steal, steal from the best, so I'm, I'm flattered, John. <laughs> um, but I, I think that that's, this is where companies get themselves in trouble because you know we're in a rush. We've got to hurry. We've got to make this change. We, we got new components that came in from the supplier, and you know they're a different color, but let's just do a letter to file, and, and let's, let's push on without doing the, the appropriate uh, amount of work and, and effort that goes into that. So that's, that's a problem. you know. And, and if you do that on one change, and then you make another change, and then you make another change, and you handle all these things the same way, um, you know what? What does that look like? What does that that this product two or three changes down the road look like when compared to the product that you originally got clearance or approval for? And now, what what John is talking about is uh, what I call change creep. So, for those of you that are familiar with predicate creep, the idea here is exactly the same. You make a change to a device. That change is not significant enough to let FDA know. You make another change to the to a device. That change is not significant to let FDA know. You make a third change. Each of those individual changes considered one at a time might not be significant, but over a long enough period of time when your device is on the market, now those changes become significant. At what point do we notify the FDA, and if so, how? Some of you are probably familiar with the phrase in the vernacular, the catch-up 510K. Officially, there is no catch-up 510K. There's only three types of 510Ks. That's not one of them. I've suggested to FDA many times we need to create one, but we don't, at least not yet. But I refuse to use regulation as an excuse to hold me back. If the regulation does not have a way to notify FDA of these changes, we need to figure out a way to make it happen. We can't use that as an excuse. So what I will do, we talked about this uh, at, at, at dinner last night a little bit. What I will do is I will use a special 510K, which has a legitimate, a significant change in it. But I will embed into that special 510K uh, the previous changes. In other words, I will say, as a matter of professional courtesy, I'm going to use this opportunity to notify you of all these other changes that we've made to our device. If FDA kicks that back on administrative reasons, I will fight them to, to, the, to the tooth because that defeats the entire purpose of being being able to to work together. So, John. Uh, question, Mike. So, if, if I'm on the fence, I you know I I do the the analysis, I do the work, I do the testing, you know the the effort to to properly evaluate and analyze my change, <coughs> and after I do that work and I'm I'm stuck, you know I go through the decision tree and I'm not sure if I should do a letter to file or if I should do a special 510k. Um, should I? Should I just go ahead and submit a, a special 510K or is there some... Some companies will take that approach. Some companies will be more conservative and if they're in that gray area, go ahead and file anyway. Other companies will be a little more, I'm not sure if aggressive is the right word, and, and, and decide to do the other way. But most important to me, John, and I don't want to put your words in your mouth, but I think you, you agree, that decision is can only be made once we've done all of that work first. Right, all right. so uh, absolutely. So. What about like a pre-submission? You know, um, I, I know you're a big fan of pre-submissions. Is this a scenario where if we're on the fence that, that we might consider a pre-submission? You could. I am a huge fan of the pre-sub process. Like the catch-up 510K, we don't have an official pre-sub type to, uh, to notify FDA of a change to an existing medical device. But there are ways, again, if you're, it's a matter of perception here. I refuse to use regulation as an excuse to do what you called from a prudent engineering. I want to be able to prophylactically notify FDA of my changes, whether I do it in a submission, whether I do it in a pre-sub, whether I do it however, I don't care as long as we get it done. We made kind of a joke a moment ago about documentation, and John was saying, you know, documentation from a regulatory perspective, I'll put some words into your mouth, John, is a good thing. But there are some downsides to having documentation. Let me ask, to actually, to illustrate um, the, the point that we were trying to make here. So how many of you, I'm, again, I'm not going to ask for your own experience, your own company, how many people think or have heard of companies where if they choose to do a letter to file, that letter to file is built out to, this, to the extent that it would be if they were submitting something to the FDA. How many people would do that? How many people would not do that? Some of you are not being honest, right? Uh, again, to, you know, John mentioned, I, I, I've seen letter to files that are like a paragraph long. I mean, a letter to file is a legitimate path, but it is not an excuse to not do what we should do as engineers. That's what gets people into trouble. So what's the downside? of making a more robust letter to file. I'll give you a huge hint. Product liability. 
product liability. For those of you that know me, I spend a fair amount of my time uh, working as an expert witness in medical device product liability cases. And one of the th cool things I like about working with my attorney friends is that they don't limit me to what FDA may or may not require. They want to know from me as a professional biomedical engineer, did what the company do, did, it, you know, did they do what they should have done? Who cares if it, was if it was required by FDA or not? That's not an excuse. Did, what the company, did the company do what they should have done from an engineering or a biological perspective, right? That's the litmus test here. Now the problem with that, when I write letter to files, and I do these a lot, I wanna write them from a regulatory perspective to cover my you know what, but I also wanna write them from a product liability expense ex uh, 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 perspective to not expose my you know what. There's sort of a fine line there. Do you understand what I mean? Maybe, John, you can uh, describe it a little bit more. Well, and I think, <clears throat> you know, all of us who have been in this space, um, I think sometimes we don't even think about the, the litigation, potential litigation aspects. We, we have a healthy fear, or maybe unhealthy fear, of regulation, you know, i.e. The, the FDA. And it seems like a lot of times what we're doing is jumping through hoops to satisfy the regulator, right? And, and um, you know, sometimes that lends us to maybe going a little bit overboard and thinking of every single use case or misuse case or, or what have you and documenting that in our risk assessments or documenting that in our, in our testing. And, you know, from one perspective, you can say that, well, I'm being thorough. But from the other perspective, you know, if something, if there were an adverse event or something that happened to the product, uh, that, that may come back to bite you, you know. So it, this is a, it's totally great, you know, and it's like, how do you know? How do you know when it's too much or not enough? Because you get it wrong in either scenario, you could have regulatory issues and you can have legal issues. So, or maybe both. Or, or maybe both. <laughs> so to illustrate a slightly different way, a lot of people that I uh, work with in companies, they tell me that they fear the FDA. And I say, no, 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 no. You should not fear the FDA. You should have a healthy respect for the FDA. After all, as one of my friends who used to be a senior reviewer was fond of saying, physicians can kill patients one at a time, but an FDA reviewer can kill patients thousands at a time. And that's something that, quite frankly, more people in our industry need to remember. So you should not fear the FDA. Who should you fear? You should fear the product liability attorneys because they can impose a heck of a lot more damage than the FDA ever could. And let me tell you, the product liability attorneys, and I happen to be de being deposed in, a, in one of my cases in just a couple of weeks, the, uh, the product liability attorneys um, are much better at finding documentation than the FDA ever will be. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm constantly amazed, because remember, I work as a consultant for the FDA. A lot of reviewers are personal friends of mine. Some of them go back to, to graduate school, some of, before some of you in this room were probably born. Uh, and it's, they're, they're flabbergasted when I tell them about changes, and, uh, and FDA says, well, we don't know. We weren't notified. Well, duh. I mean, how would you ever know about a letter to file unless something bad happens, right? So quite frankly, the agency has not a clue as to how many letter to files actually are done. I don't have a problem with the fact that they're done. I have a problem with the way that a lot of people do, the, do them. In other words, they use it as an excuse to, 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 to not do what we, what we should do. So um, I've, I've gotten a signal that there's just a few minutes left. What do you think about yeah. opening the oh, floor? I, I was just going to say the same thing, John. Let's do that. Questions. Who, who has questions about change management in, in medical device? So all right, we'll start back here in the back. Yeah, I want to ask the first thing you talked about was uh, I've never worked on the drug side, but on the drug side, you said changes never happen. Changes, let me, so, let me qualify that. Changes right. happen, but you, you, you typically have to notify the FDA. In the drug world, I'm simplifying here, but there isn't really an, an analogy to letter to file in the drug world. So, th so there's always a supplement which they have to... Of some kind. of some kind, yes. Okay, okay. So that makes it clear. Yes. Sorry about that. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh. All right. Hi. So what about... You know, I appreciate the discussion we're having, but for my money, this is really about risk management. If you have an adequate and robust risk management system and you've identified adequately your product risks, when you have a change and you're considering a change, you're looking at your risk assessment and you're making a determination if the, if the changes you're making are affecting requirements that are high risk. I could not agree with you more. You and I are preaching exactly this, or we're singing the same song, but just in a slightly different key. But here's my point. Do we need any guidance? Do we need FDA to tell us that? I mean, to me, that's basic engineering. To me, that's what they used to teach in engineering school back in the day. I'm not sure that they still do. And to me, and I'm going to set the bar very high here purposely, anybody that changes a medical device without considering risk, as you just suggested, should not be in this business. 
To me, that is such common sense. I mean, I'm sorry. I just get, I get frustrated with the amount of micromanagement that we have with regulation telling people to do things that, quite frankly, they should know to do anyway. And I was just going to build on that. You know, back in the day, d when we, design control was, used to include risk management and human factors and usability. You know, and it's, it's like, when did that, when did that go away? You know, right? So, um, so it's, it's like we keep creating like these other, you know, quote, disciplines. And not that they're wrong, it's just that they were always there the entire time. You know, when design control regulations were rolled out 20 years ago, and, e and even before that, if you're doing prudent engineering and good design and development work, Risk is part of that process. It's not a separate thing, you know? And just to take that a tiny bit further, I know we got a couple more questions. Um, I agree 100%, but we have to be careful about overgeneralizing. I happen to be a subject matter expert for FDA in a few different areas, one of them being risk. So we can say in words to take into account, you know, risk management or whatever, but what the heck does that mean? What kind of risks and what detail and so on. So, you know, the devil is in the details. And I would love nothing more than to be sitting in a court, you know, being able to say, well, this company did, you know, took, followed the, the, the guidance, you know, the new change control guidance does specify risk in it now, which I think is a no brainer for me. But if there were aspects of risk that they did not consider, you know where I'm going with that. Jeff. Uh, so what's the typical timetable for the FDA? I've never dealt with either one of these special 510K or PMA supplement. What's the typical time? table for clearance or approval of that additional information. Good question. Um, We've got a lot of real world evidence sitting in the room. Anybody want to share your own experiences? If you've submitted a special 510K or a PMA supplement, how long did that process take? Correct me if I'm wrong, but with the special 510K, there's no notification back. You just send it and it goes in the black hole and you never do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no response back. Wow. Oof, I'm glad that it's 4.30 in the afternoon. We'll continue that discussion at the pub maybe. Anybody else want to give a, a little more quantitative number? It's it's. Now we're getting into some regulatory minutia, but bottom line, um, it depends on what product code that you're in and it depends on your device. We're talking about a couple of months. We're not talking about a huge amount of time here. But here's the most important point, Jeff. In many ways, a special 510K is much easier than a traditional 510K. I don't care what the contents requirements are. I don't care what the RTHS checklist is. The only thing that you need, or I should say, the, the, the only important thing to me in a special 510K comes down to one and only one thing, and that is to demonstrate that whatever change that you've made, regardless of reasons, uh, is not gonna impact safety, efficacy, performance, yada, yada, yada. That's, to me, that's the only part of a special 510K worth reading. All the other stuff is in it is pretty much copied and pasted from the traditional 510K. Well, that's up to Joe. That's up to Joe. <laughs> He's giving you a look. Uh, so you can, so I'm a software engineer and you can change software a lot faster than you can change hardware, which is one of the top subjects of my talk tomorrow. So Maybe. Uh, that's, that's part of why I'm asking is, is say you can make software improvements every yeah. week is, is, and you do the risk analysis, you do the testing, all that to make sure that that it's safe, to your, to your point, yep. how fast can you actually feasibly push software updates to medical So devices? So philosophically, and I'm not sure, Jeff, if you like this answer or not, philosophically, to me, it makes no difference if you're changing a hardware or if you're changing a software. Uh, the, the, the mental process, the investigation, isn't exactly the same. You know, you have to go through that testing, and I'm not a programmer, but you have to go that testing. Okay, you make this change in this part of your software. How do you make sure that that's not going to have impacts on, you know, other parts of your software or of your hardware and so on? It's the law of unintended consequences, right? But there are, uh, there are a zillion mechanical equivalents to that. So in the software world, let's be honest, when the, when the special 510K was created, we weren't talking about software-based crop products. So this is another reason, another example of how we're taking newer technologies and trying to fit older regulatory models. Maybe, and I've never really thought about this before, but maybe in the software world, we need something a little different, a, a different mechanism to update FDA uh, on those changes. The most important thing, regardless of what change you're talking about, the most important thing is that we have that communication. Highly engaging, highly interactive. And I'm sorry if I threw you at a they don't, wall. They don't want to leave. <laughs> And so uh, you get to speak last from now on. <laughs> Dr. Michael Drews and, and John. 